and we didn't quite get all the way through here. We were doing these things called line integrals. And we had got to the point where we could find the area of a curtain that we dropped down off a surface. And we talked a little bit about the paths and how if you reverse the path, that might have an effect on the value of the line integral. If the path doesn't matter, then we call it path independent. And then I said today what we would do is we would extend this concept. But now our curve C, instead of it living in two-dimensional space, we're going to let that curve live in three-dimensional space. And we can still define a line integral, all right, the same way that we did in 2D, in 3D, but we just can't visualize it. So let's say we have a curve C that is defined with a set of parametric equations. So we're going to have one additional piece to this, and that's we're going to have a Z equation. Now, I'm going to use some different notation this time. So there is a, there is a slight tweak to our notation um, today. Instead of writing this, um, this curve in its parametric form, I'm going to write it in its vector form, because we know that we can draw curves in three-dimensional space with vector functions. So we, we'll write the vector r of t, this function, is equal to the vector x of t, y of t, z of t. So the x of t, y of t, z of t, z of t are the component functions of our curve. Then the line integral of the function f, what type of function is this f? We said scalar, right? We call it a scalar function. So the line integral of the scalar function f along c is given by this equation. Now that's the notation for it. All right, so that notation is exactly what we did last time. The only difference is the z in here. ds still represents the what? Arc length. Arc length. Okay, that ds is the representation of the arc length. And so when we convert this over and you say f of x, y, z, you're going to replace your x with the function of t that you have for x, which comes from the, the, the curve c. You place the y with the function you have for the y component and the z, z component. And then this is your arc length formula. But in three-dimensional space, your arc length formula changes. OK, right? This is what it changes to. So you just have that additional dz dt squared. Now this right here is where the notation really changes. All right? So what I want you to notice is that this right here, by its very definition, is the magnitude of the derivative of the vector function, r. So remember, if we have a, we've, if we have a vector function, r of t, which was given to us right by x of t, y of t, z of t, then if I ask you for the magnitude of the derivative, right, the derivative of this you would just take derivative of each one, which I could say dx dt, dy dt, dz dt. And then you take the square root of each of those squared. And that's what this is. So what we recognize is that that piece is this. It's just a different way of writing this, this line integral. And another way of writing this is going to be to use this notation. I wrote it in red here. I don't think that's in the notes that I put online, OK? I don't think I put that in the notes. And that's, what do we mean by f of r of t? So what do we mean by this? Because we've never seen this. We're, we're taking a function and plugging it into a, func a scalar function, right? Taking a vector function, plugging it into a scalar function. So this is a notation thing. What this actually represents is you're going to take the x component, right, and plug it into the x on the scalar function, the y component of the vector function r of t, plug it in for the y, and then the z component function, plug it in for the z. 
It's just weird, it's weird to plug a, a vector function into a function, so we have to understand what it means when you write this down. Okay? Let me give you an example. Look, if I give you a function of three variables, and I tell you it's uh, x times y times z squared, I think everybody is comfortable with me saying plug in 1, 2, 3, right? If I say plug in 1, 2, 3, everyone would say, oh, okay, that's 1 times 2 times 3 squared, right? That's what that would be. And so your answer would be, what, 18? But what if I said plug in um, the vector 1, 2, 3? Do you see how that's kind of strange to say that? Because we're, we're, normally we just want to plug in like a number, 1 and then 2 and then 3. But I'm asking you to plug in a vector. And that's what, that's what I'm doing here, right? So what we mean by this notation is exactly to plug in whatever this component is, plug it in, 1. Whatever this comp component is, uh, plug that in for the y. Whatever this component is, plug that in for the z. So they are the same thing. Okay, it's just a notation thing. Okay, that's all it is. All right. All right, now, if you recall from last class, when we did a line integral, initially we did it with respect to arc length. And then after that, we did it with respect to x, and then we did it with respect to y. Well, now we're going to have a similar thing, line integral of, of the, function, the scalar function f along c with respect to x means instead of having that big old square root thing out there, you just have x prime. With respect to y, same exact thing, except just y prime. And then with respect to z, just the z prime. So we have three new versions of line integrals. Why do you have to split it? Here. OK. So again, the previous three line integrals are used in later sections. OK. That we will use them. In the event that we use, um, in that event, we will use the following notation. So what we have is, we're going to have this later. We're going to have a line integral of the scalar function p along c with respect to x, plus another line integral of the scalar function q along the curve c with respect to y, and then the r function along z, uh, c with respect to z. And that's the notation. Instead of writing three integrals, since they're all going uh, along c, we just write one integral and all of them together. So right now, we don't know why this is going to have value to us. But it will be useful later for us to do integrals with respect to x, y, and z separately instead of with respect to arc length. All right. OK. Th those of you who turn this in after class start are not going to be happy with me, but I'm not very happy either. So um, these are due at the beginning of class. It's kind of become a little bit of a habit that people are coming in late, disrupting my class. I don't find that to be very respectful. So everyone who turned it in on time is getting a 10-point bonus. Everyone who turned it in late, which is everyone in this stack, is getting a penalty. I know you're not going to be happy about that, but that's life. You, uh, you turned it in late. Should we continue? Sorry. I hate doing shit like that, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's right to disrupt class like that and turn stuff in late. It's, it's not right. OK, find this line integral where C consists of the line segments from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 2, negative 1, and from 1, 2, negative 1 to 3, 2, 0. Everything is exactly the same as last class, with the exception that we're in three-dimensional space. Our curve is. So we still have to come up with parametric representations or ve a vector function which represents uh, these segments. So how about we, we look at these segments, we break them up into two pieces. We call this one C1, why don't we call this one C2? That's, that seem fair to you? 
All right. For C1, I imagine that I'm going to be going from the point 0, 0, 0 to the point 1, 2, negative 1. I'm not trying to draw this in three-dimensional space, all right? Because I'm kind of conceding that I'm not going to be able to do it real good. So I just know that I need my C1 to connect those two. And I want to go in this direction, from there to there. So how can I come up with some way of representing that either in a parametric form or in a, as a vector equation? You could do, okay, so what vector equation are you going to use? Like, how are you? Uh, find the, uh, direction okay, so this is a line segment, right? This is, so we've done this before. It's just now you're in 3D. So we're, we're still going to use the fact that R of T, we could do this one, right? R naught plus TV. We could do that. That should give me, draw that, I should be able to draw that line if I can put everything in the right way. So uh, what's R naught going to be for me here? 0, 0, 0, that's where I'm starting. So R of t equals 0, 0, 0. And t, and then how about the direction vector? It's, it's the vector that goes from here to here, so you subtract 1 minus 0, 2 minus 0, negative 1 minus 0. So it's just that vector, isn't it? That point written as a vector. Uh, 1, 2, negative 1. And this just turns out to be, I'll do it right here, R of t is T, uh, t, 2t, negative t. Okay? So we're breaking up our C into two pieces, which means I can integrate along C1 first, then come through and integrate along C2. So I'll let you choose where we go from here. Would you like to um, go get C2 now, or you want to just do this integral over C1 first and then come back and do the C2 one later? You want C2 now? Yes? OK. So we have disagreement. I don't know what you said. OK, I'll get C2 now. OK, for what about C2? Yeah, I'm going I'm to connect from 1 to negative 1 over to the point 3, 2, 0. Um, I'll call this R of t again. I guess I could use a different notation, right, if I wanted to not confuse the two. I could maybe do like R sub 2 and R sub 1, right? That might be a way of distinguishing these two from each other. Not necessary, but probably good math penmanship, I guess you could say to kind of distinguish these. Um, R naught, 1, 2, negative 1, that point, written as a vector, plus t times the direction vector, which is the vector connecting from here to here, so 2, 0, 1. And then when you put this all together, you get 1 plus 2t, two, 2, Negative 1 plus t. So you can write negative 1 plus t. You could write t minus 1, whatever. Any questions on the parameterization of that? So I'm, I'm keeping these as vector functions, right? I'm not, I'm not writing them as parametric equations. But I could easily do that, right? Yeah. OK. All right, I think I'm ready to set this thing up. And I'm erasing everything I'm going to need. All right, the line integral of x squared dx plus y squared dy plus z squared dz along the curve c is equal to the same thing along c1 plus the same thing along C2. Uh, DZ, thank you. All right, that's what that is. 
Questions? So I'm splitting up C into its two pieces. Now I need to actually figure out what each of these pieces are. Is this allowed? Tell me if this is fair. Yes, that's what the property I just showed you before said. I can't put it up here, it'll just be jumbled up. If you look back in the notes, one, I think one note before this, that's, that's property. This, this means this. Okay, let's try this first one right here. So I'm looking over C1. I'm going to replace this x squared with whatever my x component function is. What was the x component function on C1? Actually, you can tell me right here so I can write it down. One, it was uh, t, then what? 2t, two two t minus t. OK, that was r1 of t. r2 of t I've got down here, right? So I'll use that in a second. This is r2 of t. All right, so because I'm on c1, I'm looking at this. The x component squared, so this is going to be integral t squared. And then what's dx? What's the derivative of the x component? Just 1, right? The derivative of t is just 1. So it'll be, well, you, can, <coughs> you should say 1 dt, right? 1 dt. So dt, any questions on where that came from? Plus, um, oh, what's my restriction on t? Ooh, I forgot to, put, I forgot to talk about that. Oops. Both of these are 0 to 1. Why is it 0 to 1? Because that's the way it worked, right? If, if you set it up the way that we've done, that I've told you since the very beginning, then t will always go from 0 to 1. Now, that's important because I need to put limits of integration on this. So 0 to 1. What's my next one? Still looking over c1, so I'm still looking at that. Function, uh, what's the y squared? So it's 4t squared. So I'm squaring 2t. So integral 0 to 1, 4t squared. But then dy, what's the derivative of the y component function? 2dt, right? So I'll put here 2dt. Plus integral 0 to 1 again. Last one, z squared. Negative t times negative t is t squared. And then what's dz? What's the derivative of z? Negative, negative 1 dt. Follow? Plus, we keep going. Now we're looking over c2. So I'm looking at this one. x squared. 1 plus 2t. Squared. dx, what's derivative of this with respect to x? Uh, sorry, derivative of this with respect to t. I don't know why I said x. 2 dt plus this integral, 0 to 1 again. y squared, which is just this. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? 4 times, what's the derivative of that? 0, because it's a constant. 0 dt. So that integral is not going to contribute at all. And then dz dt. I'm sorry, dz. z squared dz is going to be, I'm going to have to push this right in here, integral 0 to 1, negative 1 plus t squared. And then the derivative of this is just 1 dt. So there you go, dt. Any questions on where any of that came from? All of these integrals happen to be from 0 to 1, don't they? Yeah. All of these integrals have to be with, uh, happen to be with respect to t. So I can turn this into one big integral, can I? Sometimes that won't work. Because if, if c1, let's say, went from 0 to 1 because it was a line segment, but c2 happened to be part of a circle, that might go from like 0 to pi or something, then you can't throw them all together at the end. But in this case, I can. 
and I should just have big old polynomial, right? Let's see if I can't get this written down. This will be equal to just one big integral, zero to one. Try and clean this up. I've got t squared here. And here we've got, what, plus 8t squared. And then this one, minus t squared. And then this one, let's do some, some algebra here real quick. This is 1 plus 4t plus 4t squared. Right, that's what this is. Then times 2. So how about plus 2 plus 8t plus 8t squared. Understand what I'm doing? Okay, and then here, nothing, and then square this one. 1 plus, or 1, what is it? 1 minus 2t plus t squared dt. I think that's all of it, right? Now collect like terms, and I mean, we were already there, but I decided I would take this the, the full way. How many t squareds do we have? Three? Five? I'm not even looking, y'all tell me. Five? Okay. We're all agreeing with five? Okay. No? No? Do I need to count? 17? Okay, 17? You changing your mind? All right, 17 t squared? Okay. How many t's? Six t's? And constant. We do have constant, three? dt. And I, I've come this far. Antiderivative 17 thirds t cubed plus 3t squared plus 3t. Evaluated those two points. When I plug in 0, it goes away, so I'm happy about that. When I plug in 1, I get 17 thirds plus 3 plus 3 which is 17 thirds plus 9 thirds plus 9 thirds. So 35, 35 thirds. What does this number represent? It's the line integral of along this curve C of this, all right? That's what it is. I can't assign the same meaning to it that I did last class where it was like area of curtain. Just, I can't do that. It doesn't make, kind of like when we were trying to find, do, doing triple integrals and we couldn't really talk about it as being like a volume anymore. It was like something else. All right, let's see what's up next. All right, remember back from earlier chapter, we talked about work. And this is something you probably did in physics too, if you've taken it. Work is defined to be your force vector dotted with your displacement vector. So if you're dragging a body, I mean, a cart across the um, <laughs> ground like this, right? You're applying a force, and that force can be viewed as having an angle, right, and a magnitude, so you have a direction and magnitude, and then as you move the thing around, it's gonna move from one place to the other. It's gonna have a displacement vector also. Work is defined to be the dot product of those two. So generally speaking, I have the computer actually calculating the work right now. It's taking this vector and it's dotting it with this vector. So if I, if I change my force vector and I make it longer, apply more force, I'm doing more work. All right, less force, I'm doing less work. Um, if I change and I make it where they're parallel to each other, right? 
what happens if I move this up? What happens to the work? It's going to get smaller. It's going to go to zero, actually, once I get perpendicular. And then if I go this way, I get negative work. All right? All right, so that, this is a review. You've seen, hopefully, that. And All right, now let's imagine a point moving along a curve C within a vector field. All right, so we have some curve C. Right now, let's just look at two-dimensional space to make this easy. And you're moving along this curve from one point to the other. But this curve lives in a vector field. So remember, a vector field is, is, has nothing to do with this curve, right? You just have a vector field sitting here, which means that at every point, there's a vector, right? Every point, there's a vector. So at every point on this curve, there is a vector. There's a vector doing something. I don't know what it's doing, because I don't even know what the vector field is. I'm just making it up. Okay, that's what's happening. But there's vectors everywhere. Just along that curve, there, there are, um, is your, your vector field vectors. An example of that would be an electromagnetic field or a gravitational field. You know? the, then the total work done by the field is the sum of all the work done at each point. So what we're doing is we're, we're trying to move something from here through the vector field to some other point along the curve C. As I move, I have displacement, right? Yes, I'm displacing the point. And at every single point, there is a vector that represents the field vector. And so you can look at this as being like the F that's pulling it. And then you can say the distance we travel in this direction is the displacement, right? Understand? If we dot those two together right there, I'll get the work done right there. But see, there's a problem with that. How can you have work done at a single point? You have to have displacement, don't you? So what we do is we do it on the infinitesimal. We take an infinitesimal point. Not, well, that doesn't make any sense. We take an infinitesimal segment of the curve. So what can you tell me about this displacement vector? How do you think it's related to the curve itself? It is tangent, right? Do you agree that that black vector right there, which is pointing in the direction of my displacement, should always run tangent to the curve? So like when I get over here, my displacement vector should be running tangent like this. Then I have the force pulling me. So should I just take all these vectors, the blue vectors, the vector field, and just dot them with the tangent vector? Not quite, almost, because this tangent vector changes as I move. And does anyone remember how the length of this tangent vector relates to the curve itself? It's what? I think you were right, if I heard you right. Speed. It's the speed. Exactly. So the longer the vector is, the faster the particle is moving, right? We don't, so we don't want the speed to have an effect on the displacement, because speed and displacement aren't exactly the same thing. So what we do is this. First, we try and create all these black vectors. Let's just make them all unit length. So they all have the same length. How do we do that? So let me remind you, isn't this right here the tangent vector? Yes? What is capital T? That's this vector the tangent vector divided, divided by its own length, right? Which gives you a unit vector. So let me start by doing that. Let me take, I've got all my force field vectors out here, right? Vector field vectors. And then I have all these tangent vectors that are changing length, and I'm going to do this first to go ahead and make them all unit length. So they all have the same length of one. Then I'm going to scale that unit length down to make it an infinitesimal. How would I scale this unit vector down to make it infinitesimal here? What should I approximate that little infinitesimal with? 
What do you think I should use? How, how long is that little infinitesimal, that little tiny little, that little infinitesimal piece that goes from here to here? What, what could I use to approximate that little tiny, tiny little thing? The arc length, the arc length right? Didn't, isn't that how we approximated it last class? If we want to approximate how long this is, we just used a little arc length formula. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the tangent vector, I'm going to make it length 1, and then I'm going to scale that by the actual arc length infinitesimal. And that will give, that'll, that'll pull that back so that it'll give me the displacement. I hope that makes sense. That's exactly what we do. All right, so let me show you the formula on the next page. The picture I have of this, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Uh, well, maybe not. Oh. So there's a curve. There is a, um, I want these to point in the same direction. I guess that's not going to happen. Good enough, right there. So I'm moving from this point over across like this. So when I'm at this point right here, my vector field's pulling me in that direction, right? And this is my unit tangent vector. I don't want to use that length because that's, that's not my displacement, right? But I can say it's pointed in that direction, but it's this little infinitesimal arc length. So you get this. We can see the work done is that force vector dotted with the tangent vector, which is length 1, but then scaled by the ds, which is the arc length. And if I rewrite this, right, moving the scalar to the other side using properties of dot products, this is equivalent to this. The total work done will be the, the line integral, right? the sum of all these little pieces of f dotted with t ds. Now what sucks about that formula is that in order to use it, you have to compute capital T, right? And capital T requires some work, doesn't it? Because you have to take the derivative of the curve function, you have to scale it by its own length, and that requires work, right? Understand that that would not be fun? but. Let me write this down. What is capital T? We said it was the derivative of R, right, over its own length, right? And then we have times 